Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Discovery Showcase stage Dr. Victoria Abrera, Assistant Professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience at Rutgers University. Um, yesterday, or the day before, I'm an associate professor. <laughs> so that's the only thing that's changed. And today I'll share some of our research, um, which sheds on a very complex challenge in our field, which is our ability to scale uh, pain in preclinical animal models. So as you all know, pain is very subjective. Uh, you go to the doctor and you're asked to scale your pain from a uh, happy face to a crying face. And, and here's the problem, right? So a few years ago, my crying face was probably when I got my wisdom teeth pulled. Uh, but then fast forward a few years later, uh, this was my crying face when I was uh, giving birth to my daughter. And in comparison to giving uh, birth, I would say getting your teeth pulled kind of fall around here. Um, and 50% of you might appreciate that. Um, and I think this highlights the, uh, the problem. Uh, it's just the subjective nature of pain, a sensation that's really so personal and variable that really defies a one-size-fits-all description. Now, this complexity, of course, becomes even more pronounced when we try to understand pain in animals. Uh, particularly pain in mice, which is our primary subject for a lot of our preclinical pain research. Uh, and of course, mice are the cornerstone of scientific investigation because of their physiological similarities to humans. But there's a huge catch. Uh, these creatures are masters of disguise. Evolution has equipped rodents with the ability to conceal their pain as a survival strategy to evade uh, predators. And uh, this natural behavior poses uh, a really significant hurdle for scientists because if mice hide their pain, how can we accurately measure it or scale it? And of course, this challenge is not just academic, it has profound implications for developing new pain medications and treatments. So uh, our work really tries to bridge the gap between this silent suffering of rodents and the quest for human relief. But how do we currently scale the pain experience in rodents? So we can't ask them because they can't talk. So we do a whole lot of poking. So we uh, poke them a lot and we watch for paw shakes. Now in a mouse that doesn't have an injury, is not in pain, uh, they respond a few times to a poke. and. Uh, um, but a mouse that's in pain responds to this poking with a lot more uh, paw shakes. Uh, mice also make faces, like the kinds that you see at the doctor's office. So we believe that this mouse is happy. We also believe that this mouse is in pain. So when we see these increases in these scalar metrics, we say the mouse must be in pain. So imagine that we're now testing a new drug, drug X, and we see this decrease in these uh, metrics. So we say, this must be pain relief. But what if I told you that drug X uh, is not an analgesic, but is, in fact is an anesthetic? So an anesthetic will also uh, result in a mouse that responds less to poking and will also result in a mouse that looks happy. But we know anesthetics are not good for long-term pain relief. And many drugs actually look like this drug X. You have NSAIDs look like this, opioids look like this. They both decrease those paw shakes and they also make the mouse look happier. But we know that these drugs have very different mechanisms of actions with different efficacy for the treatment of pain long-term. And I think this is why translatability from mouse to human is so slow. The very narrow dynamic range of these assays obscure drug-specific behavioral effects, which in turn prevent analgesics belonging to different pharmacological classes from being distinguished, or even our ability to distinguish between an anesthetic from an analgesic. And I think that's a problem. But we think that there might be a simple way to tackle this challenge. We intuitively know that an injured knee can change the way you walk, abdominal pain can change the way you stand, 
And chronic pain can actually change the way that you interact with each other and with your environment. And though these are very simple in nature, these behaviors can perhaps serve as these general guideposts to objectively scale pain, but also assess analgesic efficacy. And uh, so we set out to see if we could identify these types of behavioral biomarkers in mice. Uh, but first, what we really needed to do was to define specific time points for the physiological progression of pain so that we might be able to identify specific behavioral biomarkers that differentiate these time points. So how do we do that? We injured the paw or the knee of a mouse, and then we retrogradely label those sensory neurons that innervate the injured and uninjured uh, limb. And we collected these neurons either at four or 24 hours post-injury. Now, if we can wiretap into these neurons, you see that these neurons, these sensory neurons, become very excitable for our four hours post-injury, and this excitability subsides at 24 hours, which actually uh, at this time point, the 24 hour time point is when these sensory neurons start to change their gene expression. So these sensory neurons start to change basically their identity. And these results were important for two reasons. So the first reason is uh, something that we know already, that changes in brain circuits really drive chronic pain, and we already knew that. But actually, these important um, uh, timestamps uh, now we could use to probe for specific behavior fingerprints that can really differentiate between this early four hour and this late four hour time point. So we set out to see if we could do that. So again, if we poke these mice, uh, we can statistically differentiate these two time points, and, uh, and there's lots of literature that suggests this. But if you let the animal sort of like run freely in an open arena and start to score ethological behaviors, like the time it spent rearing, for example, you start to get that necessary dynamic range to start to differentiate these two time points. So can we infer a pain state, like I say, by simply observing how a mouse moves in an open arena? So like humans, um, like humans may change the way they behave when they're in pain or under the influence of medications, mice also change their behaviors as they move. But instead of relying on this limited human observation, we collect rodent behavior through the lens of a computer. Now to a computer, behavior is not uh, a series of discrete actions, but actually sort of this rich tapestry of pixel level movements, and each pixel has an X, a Y, and a Z direction. So now it kind of becomes like a math problem, right? So in much like RNA sequencing, we can use advances in computer inference to reduce the dimensionality of this data and map these pixels into these sub-second epochs and use machine learning to characterize these micro-movements as a set of modules or these millisecond micro-movements that are connected in space based on specific transition probabilities. And actually this makes intuitive sense, right? So we can characterize things like a rear, a dive, and a locomotion. And these are the three, one, two, three modules depicted here. But again, these are connected in space based on specific transition probabilities. Now if you're a mouse and you're in sort of this rear position, you have to go through dive post space in order to get to a locomotion. And these arrows and the thickness of those lines simply show that, it's very intuitive. But this is kind of what it looks for three behaviors. In reality, a video of a mouse um, running around a bucket for 20 minutes looks something like this. Each circle represented this specific micro-movement of module, like a dive or a rear or a grooming that's connected in space with these specific transition probabilities. Now, in my lab, now we're using sort of this high-dimensional data on this microstructure of mouse movement to create sort of these detailed pharmacobehavioral maps that reveal unique behavioral signatures for these different physiological and pharmacological states. Now, based on this previous result, in which we visually scored an animal rearing, and we saw oh, they spent more time rearing when they're in pain, uh, we first look at the differences in modules. How um, um, are there any changes in this module usage across this pain progression? 
And, uh, and again, much like RNA sequencing, uh, we can look at this data this way. So each module is numbered 1 through 70. We can identify anywhere between you know, 60 to 80 different kinds of modules. And they're organized in this ethological dendrogram. Uh, and that's because different movements are more related to others. Like we see six different kinds of locomotions, you know, three different kinds of rear, um, and that dendrogram kind of shows you that. And each module usage is represented here on a black to yellow scale. And what you see right away is that pain induces these uh, changes in module usages at 4 and 24 hours, and now we're getting a much more dynamic picture of how the usage of these individual modules uh, change as pain progresses. And we just simply propose that this dynamic change in these modules over time can be used as sensitive behavioral biomarkers for pain. Um, so next, we wanted to know uh, how uh, analgesics might change this picture. And here is an example of three different groups that we use. Uh, two groups of mice received an injury, with one given saline and the other one given an analgesic, and then a third arm of the group that didn't receive an injury at all, but nonetheless received the analgesic. And what we could do with this type of technology is really map these unique behavioral signatures onto this kind of pharmaco behavioral map. And what we see is that you see a very clear progression from a pre-injury state to four hours to 24 hours post-injury, um, which we validated in this study with different biomarkers. But if you give this animal an analgesic, it kind of puts them in this state. And if you look at the data, the state is a lot closer in behavior space to an uninjured mice that were given the analgesic. And so, this suggests that our understanding of analgesia in mice may be incomplete, but most importantly, I think that we can start to use these types of frameworks um, for this multidimensional behavioral screening for novel pain medications. So I started this talk by saying that um, you know, pain changes the way you move, and while this type of analysis is really good at detecting these subtle changes in, in movement, it can itself uh, describe pain behaviors, and that's because um, pixels are not behavior, <laughs> they're just pixels. And so behavior is actually quite complex, and intuitively we might view it as a combination of modules and transition probabilities each one individual, um, each one alone, not actually capable of uh, describing these different pain states. And, and, and that's the case. If we train a classifier on just the module usage or just the transition, it is at best 80% accurate at predicting these different experimental groups. So we wonder whether there's some sort of combination of modules and transitions that might better define these different pain states. Um, so now if you can imagine mouse behavior as a foreign language, what we've been able to do so far is sort of define the nouns and the verbs. And now what we're doing is putting these nouns and verbs in the right order to make sentences and put these sentences in the right order to make paragraphs. And we think that this type of analysis, um, I think, better defines uh, pain and analgesic states. So, uh, indeed, that's the case. If we use, um, if you applied an unsupervised sequence embedding technique that is widely used in natural language processing, so ChatGPT is all the rage now. But so when we do that, we see that it's actually much more accurate at predicting these different pain states, much more so than those usages or transitions alone. So, but now these embeddings really provide us with the means to identify behavioral sequences that characterize these different pain and analgesic states. So here's sort of like a word cloud that you might be familiar with of these different two or three long sort of module sequences or sentences which characterize these different experimental groups and the size of the sequence um, is, uh, correlates to, to the group and it's color coded. Um, but now, you know, we can do all kinds of experiments with this data. So if we ablate these very few, uh, very specific behavioral sequences, which represent in total 0.7% of all the modules, we see a drop in the classifier accuracy of about 7%. But if we use, um, if the same number of these random syllables are ablated, the accuracy only drops to about 1.6%. And we take these results as proof of concept, not only that 
complex behavior beyond these usages and transitions can characterize different pain states, but also simply that complex pain behaviors can be described using uh, sequence representation methods from machine learning. So uh, this work, as well as other work in my lab that I don't have the time to talk about, really starts to peel back the layers uh, on the complexity of pain and pain perception, offering perhaps some fresh insights and some new methodology. So if you want to learn more, this is the citation from the paper that we just published last year, including a preview written by colleagues that I think also highlights some of the key issues in the preclinical pain field. Um, I don't think the study answers all the questions, but I think it is definitely the step in the right direction in how we need to be thinking about uh, screening for novel analgesics in, in mice. So, but we think that really in leveraging these types of technologies, I think that we can start to decode that silent language in rodents, um, bridging that crucial gap towards understanding and treating pains in humans. Uh, and we hope that this work not only challenges the status quo, but also sets a new standard for uh, precision in preclinical pain research. So these are actually the folks in my lab that, uh, that did, well, the folks in my lab in general. We have lots of projects spanning um, the somatosensory system from skin to the brain. These are the folks that spearheaded this work in the lab, a postdoc and two uh, data scientists. Matt Ricci is a natural language processing expert, so it was a really fun collaboration. And of course, I like to um, thank all our funding and all of our collaborators, and um, thank you for the opportunity to showcase some of the work here.